In this lesson, we're going to look at some of the events during the first English Civil War, but we're going to focus a little bit more on some of the historiographical aspects of the conflict. So we're going to focus on, for example, why it was the case that the Royalists were defeated in the English Civil War and why the Parliamentarians actually ultimately win. There are a few reasons why this is the case, uh, some of these being strategic reasons, some of these being particularly related to the personalities of the leaders involved, but some of them also relate to geographical reasons. Uh, the reason why, for example, uh, the parliamentarians won uh, can be chalked up to ultimately being the fact that they had control of London, and that came with it a number of very significant advantages. So, spoiler alert on that one. Um, but ultimately, that's what we're going to do in this lesson, and we're going to cover the previous lesson, we examined the events leading up to the outbreak of the First English Civil War. Remember, there are ultimately two, but the, the main one that we're going to focus on is the first one. Um, and the reasons for this date as early as the uh, early beginnings of the Stuart period. But really, we're thinking about the outbreak of the First English Civil War. We're looking at the short parliament, the long parliament, and then looking at the events going through the Irish rebellion. We're looking at the five members incident, for example. And then we look at the fact that uh, Charles would then flee London to Hampton Court and both sides begin to raise military forces. So this lesson, as I've said, is going to examine the civil war itself, as well as the reasons for the royalists defeat in the conflict. So let's think about the Royalists in the First Civil War. We know, just from a basic spoiler alert perspective, that the First Civil War ends with a Royalist defeat and a detaining of Charles I. And the reasons for this, the reasons why, ultimately hinge on the strengths of the parliamentarians as well as the weaknesses of the Royalist forces. Due to the fact that the Royalists were unable to access London, as well as to access the south and east of England, really where the most prominent amount of riches uh, lay, and really where a lot of the most ripe agricultural areas lay, um, they were unable to control also the most heavily densely populated regions. So London, for example, being very densely populated. Not having access to London meant that they were unable to utilise the strong militia forces that had been trained as early as the 1630s within London. So these militia forces would ultimately side with the parliamentarians and be on the side of the parliamentarians, creating a significant advantage for the parliamentarians. So just given a little bit of context, some historical evidence for you here, um, by the year of 1643, the militia that existed within London had numbered around 20,000. So quite a significant fighting force and quite a significant fighting force in the sense that they were also very well trained. All of these things contribute quite significantly to the royalist defeat. In terms of from a financial perspective, there is a lot of limitations on the Royalists as well. In firstly, their um, essentially late to the party attempts to be able to raise a certain amount of taxation, um, and also for the fact that they were unable to access loans to from the City of London merchants. City of London London merchants allowed um, the loaning of revenue to the parliamentarians. This, of course, gave them a certain degree of um, advantages in over the royalists because that is a, 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 a vein of finances that they were able to tap that the royalists were essentially unable to tap. And in addition to this, uh, we have the fact that the royalists were limited to the amount of uh, support that they were able to get from abroad. They were able to get some support from abroad. We will see this in a second. But for the most part, because the control of the navy was under the auspices of parliament, they were unable to. Uh, they basically had access, sorry, to major ports, and Charles was unable to get much support from the continent. So there was some support. It was relatively small in terms of numbers and also relatively ineffective in terms of the impact that it would have over the conflict itself. We will see that there is support from Holland and also some support from Ireland. So the support from Holland comes from Henrietta Maria, um, again bringing forces from Holland in 1643. She was able to land on the Yorkshire coast, and this was the only real support that she, that Charles and and Maria Henrietta Maria got from the continent, from Europe itself. But in addition to this, they were able to conclude a secession treaty with the Irish Confederates, 
This was also done in the year of 1643 and it meant that they had access to certain amount of force from Ireland. Um, so again, this is a success on the part of the Royalists, but the uh, numbers that were actually uh, ultimately came from Ireland were very, very small and they were very, very ineffectual in comparison to the military might that was beginning to grow on the side of the parliamentarians. So let's think about some of the military history relating to the English Civil War. So for the uh, Royalists, there were a number of key victories. The problem with these key victories is the fact that Charles was unable to capitalise on any of these key victories. There were opportunities at, at key points during this conflict for potentially the Royalist forces to march on London and to try and potentially get an early and swift victory. But again, these were not capitalised on. So, for example, in 1642, there was the opportunity to march on London following the Battle of Edgehill. Now, the Battle of Edgehill was ultimately inconclusive as to the true victors. Both sides claimed that they had won the Battle of Edgehill. But essentially, um, while there was potentially the opportunity to march on London, the fact that it was an in inconclusive in terms of in terms of who won, it was inconclusive in terms of who actually dealt the 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 larger blow to the other side. It meant that it shattered the perception in both sides of the uh, of the conflict that there was going to be a swift victory at all within the civil war it, it, it really very clearly made it it made it very clear on the part of the um of the royalists and the parliamentarians that this was not going to be a swift victory at all in addition to this particular battle the battle of edge hill there were also um very cautious tactics on the part of the um uh, of uh, on the part of some of the parliamentarian uh, commanders so for for example the earl of manchester um meant essentially that they were unable to gain a significant victory in the battle of newbury despite the fact that they had in outnumbered the royalists um at, uh, at two to one so so essentially, uh, the Royalists were able to gain victory in the Second Battle of Newbury, despite being outnumbered two to one. One of the reasons for this was a cautious uh, outlook on the part of the Earl of Manchester. Now, the reason why this is the case is because even though the parliamentarians had a significant advantage, both geographically and both in terms of um, financial uh, amounts of, uh, essentially amounts of money that they had, and also the amount of trained military they had, there was still division between the various commanders within the parliamentarian forces as to whether or not they should push the royalists to capitulation or whether they should seek some kind of settlement and some kind of negotiation. Parliamentarians were able to gain advantages in certain key battles as well, so let's not just assume that this was victory on one side. They defeated Charles and the Irish provisions at the Battle of Nantwich in January of 1644, again showing that the Irish provision were not particularly uh, very effective, um, despite the fact that uh, they came over from Ireland. So even though Charles was successful in getting some forces from Holland and some forces from Ireland, the Irish provision, as an example here, uh, were defeated at the Battle of Nantwich and essentially were knocked out of the context in, in its entirety. In the same year, so in July of 1644, they were able to gain victory uh, in the Battle of Marston Moor. Again, this was with support from the Scots in terms of parliamentarian support. So both sides were utilizing the support of others um but again two victories on the part of the parliamentarians thinking more then about the ways in which the royalists were able to be defeated by the parliamentarians you have to think about the financial troubles that charles was under just like the majority of his reign there were financial troubles and these plagued his ability to gain any kind of uh, victory or any kind of stronghold against uh, strong foot against the, the the parliamentarians in the english civil war by 1644 all of the traditional levies that were used to gain any kind of financial advantage had run dry by charles now what parliament was able to do was implement effective taxation to fund the conflict but they also had access to the city of london merchant loans Again, this put them at a significant advantage in terms of financial abilities. 
It wouldn't be until 1644 that Charles would agree and actually accept that this was something that he would have to do himself. And so the institution of an excise tax would take place in 1644. But this was, as we know, a few years after the outbreak of the Civil War even takes place. So in terms of financial troubles and in terms of trying to claw back some kind of financial advantage, Charles was really fighting on the back foot for the majority of the conflict in relation to being able to fund the conflict. Overall, Parliament was able to raise more revenue than the Royalists, uh, and this gave them a considerable advantage. They were able to raise more revenue due to the fact that they had access to the larger population, to the more wealthy population, also to the fact that they had access to the City of London merchants. Coupling this with the fact that the political leadership of Parliament was relatively strong during this period, at least up until the death of John Pym, they had gained legitimacy as well from the fact that they were acting under the auspices of Parliament. And this again put a relative disadvantage to the Royalists in the conflict. The fact that they were able to control London as well meant that they were put at a significant advantage too. It should be noted, uh, I, I should note that even though we're talking about all of the advantages that the parliamentarians had compared to all of the disadvantages that the royalists had, there was still division between members of the parliamentarian forces, as I mentioned briefly when we looked at the cautious actions of the Earl of Manchester. So the divisions tend to uh, among the parliamentarians tend to fall along two particular sides you had the peace faction on the one hand who wanted to essentially see negotiations take place and a settlement take place between the royalists and the parliamentarians and then on the other hand you had the war party who wanted to see a defeat of the royalists and instead of trying to negotiate a settlement with charles they wanted to impose a settlement against charles they wanted to essentially tell Charles what Charles had to do and not let Charles do any kind of negotiations. As a result of these divisions there would be a certain amount of disdain for the ineffective commanders so people like the Earl of Manchester who were more aligned with the peace faction who remained relatively cautious in terms of their military tactics and so as a result of this Oliver, Crom uh, Oliver Cromwell would introduce in 1644 something known as the Self-Denying Ordinance. Now, what the Self-Denying Ordinance essentially did was force any member of Parliament or member of the House of Lords, any peer, to resign their military commands. And the aim of this was to essentially remove anybody who was part of this peace faction and part of this cautious attitude from the ranks of the military and allow the military to actually... Um, operate along more of a footing that was aligned with that of the war party. So the self-denying ordinance would be restricted ever so slightly in, in April of 1645 when some members of parliament were allowed to be reappointed to their military um, provisions, to their military posts. Um, but there were still uh, res uh, revisions to the ordinance as a result of this, and it was essentially effective ensuring that the divisions between the two sides did not make it to the front line. So there were still divisions in between uh, the, the more moderate parliamentarians who wanted to see a negotiation and the more radical parliamentarians who wanted to impose a settlement on Charles, but they essentially wanted to make sure that this division did not go and stretch as far as the, at the front lines itself because this, was call, this would essentially cause problems for the parliamentarians in terms of trying to win the civil war itself. The final thing I want to touch on in this lesson is the impact of a new model army that gets introduced by the parliamentarians. Um, in February of 1645, a new model army is created by ordnance. Now, the reason why this is something that is worth raising in a lesson is because it was incredibly effective in terms of the nature of the fighting force in question. So, for example, it was a single national force of 21,000 soldiers. They were all very well paid and they all um, had uh, possessed a certain amount of uh, discipline. So they were all incredibly well disciplined. They also had an intelligence department, which is relatively new at the time, um, which was responsible for gathering information about the enemy. And this was, of course, going to provide a significant advantage. And because this was a relatively new idea within sort of military strategy, um, it was taken for granted at how important and how impactful this would actually be to the point where we have intelligence departments within militaries even to this day now 
The new model army would essentially be a very strong fighting force, but the next lesson we'll, we'll do is look at still some of the divisions that begin to take shape between members of the parliamentarian forces and the sort of radical factions that begin to, uh, that begin to rise and grow in popularity during this period as well.